Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Jodhka, for delivering the Malcolm Isaiah Memorial Lecture. The floor is now open for a short discussion, which will be moderated by Professor Suresh Babu. Ramakrishna is, uh, uh, is a is a caste of uh, carpenters in Punjab. So uh, uh, the word Ramgadia comes from Ramgad. So one of they were they were OBC listed as OBC. Uh, they were local carpenters in the village, and they've been very mobile. Now Ramgadi is a very prosperous globally. They were taken to uh, Africa by the Britishers, and from there they went to Britain. So they are very influential in the Sikh establishment, diasporic Sikh establishment. Uh, they were also, but locally Ramgadias are still there. So because there was a ruler of Ramgad. So they began to identify themselves with with, with, with Ramgarh. So they became Ramgadias as caste communities changed their name. So, but in Punjab contemporary, they are a kind of OBC caste, which is an artisanal caste, as you would like to kind of compare them with somebody else. Um, this uh, relational issue while collecting data, I thought, is a very very important aspect because I think. As you rightly said, and I think as economists, when we're looking at these data sets, we always wonder whether the pattern that I'm going to expect is coming and it's really ground to thing or not. Uh, so to that extent, one of the things that has always surprised me with, about the NSS data is, I think the broad patterns are to a large extent ground to. We have always been worried about Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir because of the way the conflicts and other reasons. But I think the way you presented some of the context, it was very important. But my larger question is, we do find a lot of patterns uh, that don't defy the logic to a large extent from what we see around us. So, so the data sets are still playing a lot of important role. And how does that really happen? And are we really uh, expected to see something differently coming from the NSS? And other data sets is what I'm. I would really like to know from the non-conflict prone regions. You know what to expect and so on. And I think my second question, I think, is also related to this caste and Sikhism, which is always uh, sort of whenever I look at the Punjab data and look at so many scheduled castes, and I always wondered why that case. I think your point was very uh, relevant that. Maybe linking it to one religion is perhaps not the right thing. That also goes back to the question: How do we collect data, which could be probably more diverse and more i mean because many of us are we uh, armchair economists or desk based economics we probably can't do so much of field based work how do you expect a much better way of organizing information so this is a question which has come to me almost after every presentation that that you know you have worked in jammu and kashmir northeast and these are presumably conflict prone societies so you expect this kind of trends there uh, uh, so of late by an accident just as an accident took me to northeast an accident brought me to caste and uh, when i started examining so i examined caste data for every state for the last two or three decades as far as content errors are concerned you uh, i mean i i have good reasons now to be believe that in terms of content errors the main land is no different from the margins this one thing now the question would be does it also hold true for coverage errors coverage errors are you know whether you fully accounted for everyone or not uh, Coverage errors. I would expect a serious coverage errors in Central India, Chhattisgarh, other places. For other places, I uh, will not be able to directly comment because I have not done field work. But I would one day want to do it. But coming to your larger question, that the data generate patterns and trends which seem to be intuitively plausible, which something which now. What exactly is intuitively plausible to us is uh, something which has been shaped by successive rounds of these censuses. So when we are uh, generating the the, the the trends and patterns, so they are dependent on a process, and that process so we have to understand that process. You know, our judgment of census or national sample survey, to be more precise, 
the review question is not independent of the national sample survey. Right. So, uh, I mean, to, to give an example, so in in uh, in Manipur, I was doing a field work be before the outbreak of this conflict there. I, I realized that in many villages, the house of the chief was marked as the place where they've done the uh, survey. And this is good because you cannot enter the village without his permission. But it, it just struck me that in most small villages, one-eighth of the households are chief's household, and because these villages distributed over radiant and TADA requires you to confine yourself close to the main road, so a larger proportion of the sample will be close to the chief's house and the main road so your estimates of consumption and other things are going to be structured by that or you know uh, uh, in Nagaland because this you know I was talking to Professor T.C. Anand so apart from insurgency this concern about going far from your you know uh, urban headquarter meant that a lot of surveys were confined to five kilometers of the of the you know this main road. Now uh, this five kilometers of bus routes was fixed in 1991. So bus routes expanded much faster than the national sample surveys sample. Now so but now uh, we see a trend in Nagaland which seems to be fine. But but our understanding of this trend is gen our understanding is linked to this. It's not independent of this. I would say that we need um, um, we need to uh, look. I mean, if economics has to develop its own field economics. You know, every other social science has its field. Economics is the only one who believes they're going to field is based of time. Most of them feel that. I mean, I was trained as a game theorist, so. Field meant you know just the notebook and the computer screen that was the best field for us. But then you know eventually we started going off. Um, uh, the other thing that I should you know very briefly uh, point out is that it could be that the overall patterns are more or less fine, but because the Indian state is now penetrating deeper and deeper, right? And the issue subcategorization of whether in terms of caste or tribe is now at the forefront. Content errors are, are ubiquitous across the country. I mean, I, 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 I mean the internal caste, you see, in, in Uttar Pradesh, for instance, there are 60 something castes. Only four castes have population, I think, more than 5%. And the generic castes, combined population, I mean, the generic caste population is more than the combined population of 56 castes, I think. Now, uh, you're talking about margins of error, which are huge. And you're talking subcategorization in case of data. And this is true for every state of India, for Punjab, Maharashtra, have done for. So um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the mainland, the fact that data are fundamentally politically shaped in, in a way will hold true across these, con these states. The actual manifestation of the politicization will take a different, you know, uh, uh, shape. I got a WhatsApp a few months ago saying that we belong to, I mean, we should make sure that in the forthcoming census, we should declare our caste correctly. And I said, uh, and I said, this thing, this exactly sounds like the postcards I've seen from 1951 saying that all the agrawals of this should, you know. So I think, you know, the, the actual manifestation will change, but the problems and the way it affects still will be there. Uh, yeah, Punjab is, uh, is the largest proportion of scheduled castes. Uh, in 2011, it had 31.94% of its population listed as scheduled caste. It has 39 communities which are listed as scheduled caste, large number of groups. Uh, and interestingly, in 2001, uh, it was around 27.8%. So there was more than four percentage point jump uh, in the total pop scheduled caste population of Punjab. 
uh, it surprises lots of people from outside you know why is it but punjab uh, does not have an st list so for example in 2005 there was a community of uh, what are called as matars or rai sikhs uh, they had been kind of pushing the state for a long time and finally they were added to the scheduled caste list for obvious political reasons so there are many other communities which if there was an st list and there are scholars who have written on tribes of punjab uh, as such punjab doesn't have forests so there are no people who are living in in kind of you know isolated areas so that's why perhaps in punjab haryana delhi they don't have st lists but there are communities who would uh, describe themselves as or they are known as kind of tribes of punjab for example sansis the new uh, denotified community so there are many of these communities who have never had experience of untouchability but they are listed as scheduled caste so that also i think my own estimate the the the, the dalit population of punjab people who have had experience of untouchability their number would be around uh, 23 24% that's my estimate which is perhaps slightly higher than haryana but also because this historically has been a prosperous region Uh, so we have some evidence we have communities from other parts migrating and these migrations are still going on from colonial period onwards it has been a kind of prosperous region uh, also uh, punjab is a state where all communities have their scs unlike some other states where the muslim and christians don't have sc communities in punjab uh, uh, sikhs also were listed right from uh, 56 onwards listed as scheduled caste they are the list were listed as scheduled caste Uh, i was told by the local welfare department that even those who have converted to christianity they give them scheduled caste certificate without any problem so there is no restriction there are only 2% muslims in punjab or less than 2% so they don't have scheduled caste but everyone else has so but again there is this internal dynamics of four five communities make for around 70% or 80% of sc population and there are communities which are very tiny the sub classification is something that that needs to be taken seriously if the state is 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 willing i'll come to this in a short while uh, how do we collect data this is linked to that i think uh, my own argument is that you need to have national level categories right? because india is a nation state and there are central level policies for that you need data but if you have genuine political will to politically engage with caste then every state needs to have a regional caste commission its own caste commission which should list its communities it is done empirically the moment you go to the field you make list of 39 communities 66 communities tamil nadu will have its own list. all the administrators know in in rajasthan for example jats are listed as obc in some districts and in some districts they are not listed as obcs so administrators know the diversities of caste but we as social scientists we kind of want to have convenience of a pan indian kind of data set so but that can be done at various levels if you have political will at every state level you have separate caste commissions and these caste commissions should also build clusters of obcs and scs and this is a good classification but i think the word b needs to be taken out i mean the backward is a very strange word i mean nowhere in the world people would anyone will have the courage to call people as backward <laughs> it's a judgmental category likewise words like low caste upper caste we continue to use them i mean these are scandalous you can be filed you know there there should be court case if anybody writes the word low caste there should be court case because it's a judgment uh, let's say think of an sc student coming to you know write research and describing his community as a low caste it has an identity effect is crime is violence right so we need to have a different language of caste if we are politically interested in engaging with caste that's what my problem is that if you put it in tradition and then to fossilize these categories in the moment everyone wants to rush into obc why do you call it other backward castes classes you could have thought of some other categories historically marginalized groups or marginalized groups less marginalized more marginalized those are developmental categories but these are judgmental cultural categories so i think uh, if there is political will uh, it is possible to do you can have categories at the global level like you know you can if you were to i think caste is a better category than race and some of the scholars in us also now are coming back to caste in early 2000s there was a caste school of race relations that disappeared because then caste became a hindu institution right but caste is not an indian word caste came to us from europe right so we can think of caste as in the manner in which i was talking about institutionalized humiliation uh, ascription based hierarchies so it's possible to use a language through which we can empirically map these inequalities and differences 
I need to use this. Okay. Um, seeing the, uh, a uh, point that I want to make, which uh, takes off from what you said, I agree completely about the uh, uh, understanding uh, of, of materiality in caste. That's absolutely correct. Um, and that caste can exist not in the sense of hierarchical ascription, uh, but caste as inequality can exist even when there are no Brahmins to quote what you said. I mean, to, on the flippant side, uh, you know, the Brahmins are after bigger fish now. They want to head <laughs> IT companies <laughs> in California. They're not interested here uh, to indulge in ritual humiliation. I mean, so, uh, you know, this identity based view of caste, which everybody indulges in. Right. I mean, those who want to get rid of caste and to some extent, also caste activists are projecting it all the time. Uh, now, uh, however, what I'm going to say might just confirm your view of the simple mindedness of economists. But the idea of inequality that you bring, and I think it's completely right. And I disagree with this idea that uh, caste is just ident identity after all. Because there are inequalities which are mediated by caste because of historical disadvantage. However, uh, and you say that economists, and it's largely true, think of inequality as inequality of wealth and income. Oh, Piketty, of course, you can't blame Piketty. After all, he's working in a different context. Now, however, uh, Sen has almost 50 years ago, 45 to be precise, I think it's 79, uh, uh, propose that we think of inequality not in terms of income, but in terms of capability, right? What individuals can do, and to stretch it a bit, uh, uh, therefore the evaluation should be, uh, have we created a society wherein all individuals have the same capability to not, not do the same things, but do the things that they value? Now, if that is so, if we are agreed, not you and I, if we as a society are agreed on that, uh, there is absolutely no problem eliminating caste. We eliminate inequality by equalizing capabilities across the population. Then caste as identity may remain. Some remain proud of their caste, etc. I'm not sure much, much can be done about that. I'm not sure much needs to be done. Here I'm going back to my, um, you know, <laughs> JNU education saying that I would, I would trash that as false consciousness at any level of the current hierarchy. I repeat that at any level. I don't see why I should take that kind of identity too seriously. The people are entitled to, to take that view and say. So once again, I just want to say that, uh, uh, if you think of inequality as inequality of capital, which I think we should very seriously, uh, then really here, here you might think once again of economies being simple minded, but there's no problem in eliminating the problem. The essential, uh, uh, inequality that caste represents, oh, the inequality of capability. And uh, here I just want to say that you talked about political will. You're absolutely right. There's no reason why we can't have this. And, uh, you know, you can do it by just having, uh, you know, the same quality of public schooling of a, of a very high order, for instance. Now, um, by no means has uh, it been eliminated. But interestingly enough, the identity aspect or recognition of identity of various caste groups especially the top upper caste groups, has vanished in Kerala without a bloody revolution, right? So it is possible to social change to do that. I don't think it's a hopeless, hopeless thing as many activists even like to proclaim. Yeah. So I just to con conclude that I, I, I'm not sure even uh, uh, the cultural that uh, uh, your position in the hierarchy uh, commands will retain, will remain, sorry, uh, or will have any credibility if everybody in society has the same capabilities as you have. Thanks. Thank you. I disagree with you at all. I mean, it's not 
kind of i completely as you said i would also uh, kind of go along with sane's point of view and i think there is also an underlying uh, assumption in sane uh, which uh, see identity is not as simple as it might appear right. once you have identity inevitably there would be two things one is identity competitions and second identity evaluations right some kind of judgmental evaluation of identities right but you can't escape identities man and woman for example right they are two different identities they are not biologically different only biologically different but they are huge inequality there which i don't talk about the point i'm trying yeah yeah i am coming to yeah that's the point i'm coming to so that's why yeah so caste is talked about a lot but we have to learn from feminists and there was this whole in the 1990s in west new social movements and the new social movements politics of new social movement was to expand the sphere of normal that's what the, what is normal what is normative right that's where this whole question of sexuality comes in so what kind of sexuality is normative the moment you make heterosexual not normatively acceptable there's a new hierarchy emerging there so the point i'm trying to make is that identities are inescapable at one level but i think if we are politically interested in in somehow working towards an equal society i don't think there would be any society ever which will be equal that is difficult but you know those inequality could be irrelevant inequality like marx would talk about in communism or something like that so those dreams utopia dreams people have had and that is that is visualizable right but at the same time symbolic is not something which is reducible to capabilities this is something on which sain perhaps is more or less silent because this whole question of the way images are constructed in media right media plays so such an important role why do we think of men and women as being different black skin or body types these are not simply matters of exceptions right so how do we my own argument would be that yeah you can keep you can tolerate identity tolerate is a wrong word but we can for the time being use this word but we need to also expand the sphere of citizenship where we are just equal like in this institution if you are a faculty you are just equal you are a faculty member how do we work towards that language and culture where the sphere of citizenship continuously expands right your identity you go and kind of celebrate in your own form at home but at the same time identities produce images and images are not just for yourself images are also for others and in a nation state which identity will become normative identity if religion becomes religion was not supposed to be our primary this is a secular state why the hell do we have minority commission i never saw myself as a minority right is the muslim elite have a strong problem with that precisely is yeah. a is a yeah. muslim no no it is yeah it is the muslim yeah yeah it is a muslim elite that produce this a muslim elite that produce hindu majority we should recognize that and we should point this out yeah i never say that sikhs are a minority they should not be why should they be minority i am a sikh i am different that's all right why should i claim my identity as a sikh in mids right and say that yeah since i am also 2% you need to have one sikh symbolically present here i like diversity but diversity also normalizes majority right so when how does one work on that i think that is something on which we need to spend more time and i think there is already a lot thought by feminists because feminists have been working on it very seriously because they have to work with images and that's where economists have not really entered but i think we need just like there i would go from divine side is correct divine yeah. side that's so much deeper i would go with nancy fraser yeah yeah something uh, like that yeah so look, i thought the state is culture Yeah, again, this is yeah. the one. This is the one. Yeah. There is no tension whatsoever. The state should not give any impression. But the state, especially of of of, of hierarchies, especially yeah. Yeah. should not uh, uh, give any impression of recognizing cultural gap. Yeah. Now I'm saying this state becomes very critical with the point that they were making yeah. is that all these categories are institutionalized by state in a simple mindedness, rural and urban. does it really make sense empirically right but rural urban gets institutionalized in the state statistical system and once it is institutionalized in the state statistical system there is 70% of india which is neither rural nor urban right we know that empirically right but the, the policy is not an illusion 
I'm not saying it's an illusion at all. I'm saying that is the way, that's the starting point. That is the starting point. But beyond that also, there is a cultural sphere and symbolic sphere, unless we recognize symbolic also as material. Amart the Amartya Sen doesn't do that, right? He does that choice comes, yeah, but then as if it is possible, right? If women, you give them all possible uh, elite women in India, now they have everything. Even middle class, low middle class, parents are very keen to educate their daughters, right? They're very happy to educate their daughters and daughters are doing much better than, than sons. They're very proud of, men are very proud of their daughters. And this is a phenomenon that we need to, we need to document. Even the, you know, slightly upper worldly, mobile, working class men also are very happy to do, happy with their daughters studying, right? But do they become equal? They're healthy. They also middle class, elite women have all the health possibilities. So even just capabilities by themselves are not, Enough. That's the point I'm making. Unless we also focus on identities in a symbolic manner, which destabilizes their permanence. And this is something that needs to be done at many levels. I've also not thought through it much, but I think the point that you're making, I think that's the direction in which we can and cast at some level the moment that the problem I have with the Pankar Gupta, the moment you say that identities, identities can persist. The moment you have identities, they're also judged. Which identity do you have? If I don't have, if I live in slum, all my people are poor. I might say, Poth Chamara, they are very pride. I take pride in being Chamar. But the moment I come to the public sphere as a Chamar, I am a Chamar. Chamar is Dalit. Others are also going to identify you as, as Chamar. Right? So there is whole dynamics, which is, which is a cultural sphere. But cultural doesn't mean that you need only linguists to talk about it or culture studies people to talk about it. But if we need to have localized thinking, that's why it becomes very critical to have localized engagements with realities of caste at, at regional level. But then you can also have comparative imaginations on that. I, I'm really enjoying this exchange, actually. So I, I didn't want to <laughs> put in the scene. But, but one, one word that I feel um, is, I'm, I'm going with Professor Jodka here, is caste is not only experiential, but it is also relational. Yeah, yeah. And that is why the symbolic aspect that you're talking about is very, very important because even if we have capability-wise equality, the relational aspect of caste will always persist if the identity is allowed to be symbolically caste and we don't actually work on that aspect. of That's all I want to add. Thank you. I mean, this is uh, something on which a lot has been written. Uh, what happened in Punjab that within six months, everything was done, right? So the entire, nearly entire population of Hindus and Sikhs from Western Punjab moved to Indian side or they were killed, right? Or likewise, it happened in Punjab was 60% of Punjab population everywhere was Muslim. Now, Indian Punjab after partition had 1% Muslim population. Now it is around 2%, right? was left with only 1%. The Pakistani Punjab, which again, they were like, you know, 15% Sikhs and uh, another 33, 32% Hindus. They were left with like perhaps 0.1% of the Hindus and Sikhs together in Pakistan. In case of Bengal, migrations are still continuing. I mean, you see in Bangladesh after this, you know, recent uh, coup, we have complaints of the lots of, uh, so lots of Dalits came from Bengal slowly. And in Calcutta, they are also, they are called as colonies. And the caste question is very closely tied to the partition question in Bengal, not in case of Punjab. So there are other details, but, but these are different stories, altogether different stories. Kind of violence that we saw in Punjab didn't happen in Bengal. Very few people, have, Muslims continue to live in Bengal. They make for like 26% of the Bengal population. So it's a very large population of Muslims in, in Indian Bengal. Right? In Punjab, they came down to 1%. Two small clarifications. <laughs> one to Vikas and one to Professor Surinder. One, because uh, uh, what is the kind of an uh, international picture we have when we talk about coverage and omissions of census? Means India, we say we other countries. Is it uh, coverage. coverage and omissions when we talk about census? For example, some of these countries have self-reporting in census. It's not enumeration. Are, are those countries having much wider coverage compared to the Indian data that we see? Or what is the what is your kind of take? One. 
and uh, one to uh, Professor Jodka. Uh, there is also some literature in terms of caste and entrepreneurship. Now, how do we really see that in terms of your own kind of conceptualization of caste? The coverage errors are more or less comparable. Now, uh, but the actual coverage errors, um, they deviate widely. So, um, and, and the coverage errors would deviate widely with respect to weaker sections of the society. And, and so I'm not so, and I'm not on work on, on other countries, but but, but I'll be particularly interested, not in the national level coverage errors, which are comparable. I'll be interested in how these coverage errors are distributed across different sections of the society. And is it the case that weaker sections have higher coverage and content errors? And because the weaker sections are dependent on the state, do they coverage errors and content errors have a serious impact for them compared to the community. So that's a very good point, but we need, you know, more uh, disaggregated comparisons. Yeah, I have a chapter in my book on caste and contemporary India on, it's called Dalits in Business. Uh, it also appeared in EPW before that. I did field work in Saharanpur and Panipat on Dalits trying to do business in urban market because rural employment has declined and they are forced to migrate. What do you do in the city? Uh, don't get jobs. But I think it became a slogan or became fashionable in the post-90s context when the new liberal state was trying to push this agenda across all communities that we need to kind of, you know, self-make and be entrepreneurs, startups and stuff like that. So I think it's part of that. And then this whole narrative of Dalit millionaire comes up. Um, but if you look at the list of uh, billionaires in India, which is now very large, uh, I don't think there's any, any Dalit there. Uh, so, but coming to my own empirical work, uh, Dalits have no choice but to be entrepreneurs. And uh, being entrepreneur in a very descriptive sense of the term is not something very new. You know, Dalits have also always been in business. I mean, to think that they have never been in business is also, we have a stereotype of Dalits, right? Leather work, all this work. I mean, people living in urban areas also use, used to wear shoes earlier also. So leather had a huge market. I think we need to work on that, you know, pre-colonial uh, uh, mercantile connections that uh, Dalit commodity production had. We have no literature. We don't even frame those questions. While Dalits were producing commodities, I mean, the entire you know occupational structure in whatever you call. So leather was a very important thing and only Dalits worked on it, right? Uh, the lot of dead cattle. And this leather would have been also finding trade routes in different parts of the... So if you... You would be able to identify a few Dalits in, say, 17th, 16th century Tamil Nadu who were doing this kind of trade. And doing. So it's nothing new, but this now becomes a fashionable thing because state wants to kind of, and the slogan was that, why should you be a seeker of employment? Why don't you become a provider of employment? How do you provide employment? When I did my study, most of them, when they come to the, to the town, they don't have collateral. Right? In Haryana, Punjab, Dalits have no land. Uh, most of them have no land. And if, if you have in UP, it'll be half an acre of land. So you don't get collateral. So you will go and, you know, three, four things that came out. So they don't, they can't raise loans. They don't have personal wealth. You know, they, they're not able to start very good business. And then uh, there is no discrimination in the market as such because there is a level of anonymity. But there is discrimination if you want to open a shop and you want to go to a particular area uh, and, the, and, the, and the shop belongs to a particular caste. So all small town, even perhaps in, in, in Chennai and Delhi, uh, urban economies are controlled by caste ghettos. Uh, there are certain communities, say for example, in Delhi we have these Agarwal suites, right? And this is not this is not a franchisee. I remember how it came up, and you have a sweet shop. After some time, it becomes Agarwal suites. Right? So I don't know whether it's being run by Agarwals or not, <laughs> right? So uh, likewise, if you go to to, to furniture market in in, in Kirtinagar, it will all be the Sikhs, and they obviously yeah. protect them. Precisely. So these boundaries are very actively, proactively created. So Dalits find it very hard to enter those boundaries. I remember one of them told me that, you know, when they, for example, if Dalit business is in crisis, it's very difficult for them to come back because everything is gone. 
right after that there is no network which will save you you go back to typical kind of you know network so there is no network and this person told me the moment they hear my cast it appears like a snake has dunked them they say saap saap ne sung liya so there is active discrimination but most importantly they don't they don't have collaterals and they can't uh, find people to be witness who the bank will trust and these are usual resources that's why caste becomes relational it materiality of caste it kind of manifests in many different way uh, some communities have been able to kind of mobilize those resources like you have dalit uh, uh leather workers in 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 agra but again it goes back to the old perhaps traditions historically they have been able to do well or in punjabi leather workers in calcutta so we need to work on those communities also but their community networks are still limiting you know when it comes to big capital big wealth it is again only in south india that you have the so called obcs who have been able to enter enter big wealth because you did not have the baniya trading caste as 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 already present right kammas and 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 you know, uh, reddies have been able to come into big business in in we did a mapping of the big wealth 1000 crore plus you know haroon list and stuff like that there are no dalits in that list and there are lots of self made uh, billionaires in india but all of them are from uh, you know kind of you know expected uh, groups right? so sections of obcs in some regions have been able to get into the big wealth but if you look at the big entrepreneurial wealth it is mostly confined to again communities which have other resources so we can see yes, uh, uh well, let me ask about uh, sahasdaris one other word came to my mind which i didn't ask about uh, Uh, nirankaris and sahajdaris uh, about sahajdaris kushwan singh has written about sahajdaris but about nirankaris uh, there is uh, only in encyclopedia i could uh, find some material other than that would you like to comment upon because they are also becoming a social group called uh, nirankaris and radha swamis etc thank you so in your study you can see how many people in are, are in clri how many people are working in uh, <laughs> leather research institute okay <laughs> <laughs> other things sir uh, how the uh, sdgs like sdg 10 we talk about reducing inequalities how your concept uh, how you can uh, make uh, conceptually uh, a narrative so how is beyond the taking the gini coefficient and all uh because when we have to talk at national international level these things becomes very complicated so how we can calculate and at the end of the day, at the end of, at the end we have to calculate on showcase that's the thing uh coming to your question first yeah absolutely i mean this is again connects to the point that we were discussing earlier so it also tells us how at global level we can have common language right when comes to sdgs it will have to obviously operationalize at the local level because problems are local so this also comes from the same entitlement approach that you should expand capacities of your population so that you know the whole idea of citizenship also was to expand spheres of citizenship initially it was only civic citizenship but then people also talk started talking about health education housing how do you expand that and thinking of you know the multi dimensional notion of poverty which you know following amartya sen so i think that is the way to go i think when we are talking about changing the society or development we need to have viable categories through which we can compare globally we are all part of the global economic system whether we like it or not there is nothing called nation state there are nation states are political boundaries but we are all living in the same world right we are affected by each other so we have to think of ourselves globally but at the same time it will have to be done locally right so the local context can also be translated in that global language very easily capability is not something that's like cast can be easily translated into workable policies when i am saying that take out hinduism because hinduism doesn't let you work because you are stuck in that mind but who is hindu all those hindus they are in california they want to take up <laughs> of brahmins right so where is where is the brahminness of that brahmin yes they are caste is there not that the caste goes away but that that aligns very well with the racial culture there because there is 
culture of hierarchy and inequality which america promotes in many different ways right so they don't feel uncomfortable they don't get seen as 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 being being abnormal so about uh, nirankari is it's uh, it's a slightly complicated question because the word nirankari has two meanings one is the original nirankari that was used by the sikh gurus so gur nirankar the god is without any akar without any shape that is part of the larger bhakti movement that god is not somebody you can see and you can so therefore they don't believe in in a physical god physical guru right so the god is god is without any akar but then there is also you know once the the 10th guru decided that now onwards there are no living gurus you will have to worship the book and the book is everything is there in the book all the gurus and their their writings plus other people whom whose writings they collected some of them are muslim uh, muslim sufis the people like kabir and ravidas who are you know dalits from up so there's a whole i think there's 39 or 40 of them whose writing is there so the 10th guru said this is your god right there's no guru not god this is your guru and if you worship the book learn the book read the book that's why sikh means your student you have to read the word and learn from the word and then so but after that there were lots of people lots of individual ambitious people they said that we don't believe in this we believe in what nanak had said what all these gurus had said but we will have a physical guru as well so there are many sects came up in sikhism which were aligned to sikhism but the later on sikhism said that they are not sikhs so which include the uh, namdharis who tie a white patka they also have a living guru nirankari each one of them has a different history nirankari is also have a living guru right so nirankari became also a point of conflict in in 1978 and after that they were kind of sikh establishment said they are not sikhs at all but they are still very influential but they are not a caste nirankari is more like a subsect within sikhism or what i like to call it not even within sikhism they are kind of now independent likewise radha swami they have a, they have a living guru but radha swami has its own history now their main dera is in bias near amritsar but it starts in agra Right. there is a book by uh, jargans mehra on 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 uh, the, uh, this uh, radha swamis there is work on nirankaris as well there is anthropological work on nirankaris as well there is a book by 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 upinder o p i n d e r upinder thakkar t h a k k r on the sects within sikhism where she talks about all these groups you know sarans that is Sahajdari is uh, the word that comes as the opposite of Keshadar. Right? I am a Keshadari Sikh, but majority of the Sikhs are now Sahajdari. They don't keep here, but they call themselves Sikhs. So that is also kind of contentious. So lots of Sikhs became Keshadari after 1920s when the movement started, the, the Gurudwara reform movement, and it was also impact of colonial rule because colonial rule, colonial rulers began to recruit Sikhs as In, in the British Army, certain caste groups among Sikhs, and they were described as martial communities. But they would recognize you as Sikh only when you are wearing the five Ks, the turban, and keeping here. So there was expansion of the number of people who become Keshadari Sikhs. So Sahajdari is somebody who Sahaj means taking it slow, taking it easy. So they don't keep here, but the other ones are Nanak Namleva, the other Sikhs, and the other people. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for the engaging discussion. May I now invite uh, Professor C. Selvaraj, MND Trust Chairperson, to deliver the Chairperson's address, please. It's a special meeting because we have three awardees here: Professor Pulapra Balakrishnan and the two awardees of this year. So it gives me a great pleasure to uh, thank all of you for having attended this meeting. Malcolm and Elizabeth. Uh, Ajaysia Trust has an abiding interest and deep commitment to nurture and promote intellectual dialogues in the domain of development studies. Towards this mission, our trust has been organizing award functions and memorial lectures in honor of Dr. and Mrs. Ajaysia. As all of you are well aware, that Ajaysia's Professional interest transcended 
the boundaries of diverse disciplines and <clears throat> genres of social science research. Aligning with this, he actively engaged himself to accomplish a conjunction between research output and design of public policy. The chairperson, Sri Gopalaswamy, mentioned it. And um, since I have started my career under Dr. Adhisheshya, I know how he insisted that all of us young research officers have to have a practical mindset and not get too much involved in technicalities of economic research. So he he was a very good mentor and guide for those of, uh, for all of us who began our career under him. The Malcolm and Elizabeth Alzheimer Trust, therefore, recognizes the path-breaking contributions of leading social scientists and honors them with Malcolm Adesheshi and Elizabeth Adesheshi Awards annually. Besides, the trust actively supports pure and applied research, projects, publications, institutional funding, best teacher award in economics, and library support in addition to training programs. Dr. Venkatachalam, who is our trustee, has mentored so many uh, project applicants by taking special interest in holding training programs in methodology of research. On this important and landmark occasion, I wish to pay my tribute to my teacher, Dr. Balakrishnan's teacher also, Professor C.T. Kurian, our founder trustee, who is no more with us. And I like to remember him. He's an iconic teacher, disciplined administrator, prolific writer, a robust thinker, and a public intellectual. Dr. Kurian's stewardship of our trust is par excellence. He played a significant role in the formative years of the trust. The Malcolm and Elizabeth Alzheimer Trust deems it a great privilege and honor to present the awards to Professor Surinder and Dr. Vikas Kumar in recognition of their signal contributions to their social science research. Professor Surinder is the 24th recipient of the Dr. Malcolm Adesheshi Award. And one of the Dr. Malcolm Adesheshi Award is, is also a Nobel Laureate, Dr. Abhijit. And I hope more of you will become eligible for Nobel Prize or equivalent prizes. <laughs> and Dr. Vikas Kumar is the fifth uh, recipient because it, it was recently created, recipient of the Elizabeth Alsisha Award. The jury of eminent intellectuals have concurred that both awardees have made exemplary contribution in their respective fields of study and infused fresh perspectives in the realm of social inquiry, as you have seen how Professor Pusurinder and Dr. Vikas Kumar brought in so many new insights into their areas. Actually, these two lectures are not by any design. They are related, mutually supporting, but we did not plan it that way. But it just happened. I think economists use the word invisible hand. <laughs> I think it has happened is like that, and that speaks a lot for Indian intellectual uh, permanent, how convergence of thinking takes place in a particular setting. So I take this opportunity to thank uh, the director of the MIDS, who I think uh, was more than cooperative in organizing this program. I think he was always available to us, setting aside his uh, bureaucratic protocols and uh, procedures. He went out of the way to help us to organize this program in MIDS. We are also uh, very happy that we got an opportunity to have this program in MIDS, especially during your, your Golden Jubilee year. And uh, Dr. Adesheshya and Dr. Kurian would, be, would have been very happy 
to have this program here. Thank you, Dr. Suresh Babu. And I'd like to thank the chairperson, Sri Gopala Swami. And um, I must thank uh, Mr. Narasimhan and uh, Mr. Prasanna for um, really going out of the way uh, to help us for their seamless support and cooperation. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I'd now like to invite Professor Venkada Chalam, RBHA Professor at MIDS and MNDA Trustee for a formal vote of thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, MNEA Trust in general and Professor uh, Silvaraj in particular for having kindly agreed to organize this uh, very important event at MIDS. Indeed, in the past for some years, this event has been hosted somewhere else outside MIDS, but uh, at our request, he has uh, agreed to host this uh, event at MIDS in collaboration with uh, our institute. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, sir, for this uh, uh, great uh, kind of uh, honor to us. And uh, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Suresh Babu, our director, uh, you know, for his um, able leadership in organizing this particular event at MIDS successfully. He also delivered welcome address as well as read the citation of the Elizabeth Adisasia Award 2024 in addition to introducing uh, Dr. Vikas Kumar, who is the recipient of uh, this award. And I'd like to thank uh, our uh, chairperson, Sri N. Gobal Swami, uh, who presided over this uh, function and delivered presidential address. And I'd like to thank Professor V.K. Nadraj, who is supposed to have uh, delivered the welcome address here, but unfortunately could not uh, make it for the function today because of uh, some unknown reasons. And um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Selvaraj once again for uh, having uh, presented the Elizabeth Adhisesia Award to Dr. Vikas Kumar and to Professor, uh, I mean, Malcolm Adhisesia Award to Professor uh, Surinder Singh Jodhka. And uh, uh, indeed, I would like to congratulate as well as thank uh, Dr. Vikas Kumar, the recipient of Elizabeth Adhisesia Award 2024 who has delivered a very excellent lecture on data development and democracy, the political economy of the Indian census. Thank you so much. And uh, I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Professor Ajit Menon, who introduced uh, Professor uh, Surender Singh Jodhka and uh, also read the citation of the Malcolm Adhisesha Award 2024. And I'd like to again congratulate and thank uh, Professor Surinder Jodhka for uh, uh, receiving this uh, very prestigious award, Malcolm Elizabeth, uh, sorry, Malcolm Adisesha Award 2024, and delivered a wonderful lecture on um, uh, the caste system in India. And I would like to thank uh, once again the members of uh, MNEA Trust who has uh, been uh, supportive of all our activities related to this event at MADS. I'd like to thank all our faculty members, students, the project staff, administrative staff who took uh, responsibilities of organizing this uh, uh, event at MADS successfully. And uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Prasanna for his uh, excellent comparing of the entire event today. And I would like to thank uh, everyone of you who have uh, come all the way to participate uh, in the uh, event today. Thank you so much. With the National Anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jaya hai Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab sindh gujarat maratha Dravid utkal bhanga Dindya Himachal Yamuna Ganga Uchala Jaladi Taranga 
तब शुभ नामी जाहे तब शुभ आशीष माहे गाहे तब जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे पारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे